today we're in part five of our series, Game Plan. And if you're just joining us, the whole concept of the series is really pretty simple. Uh, just like in a sporting event, if a team wants the best chance of outcome on the field or on the court, whatever sport it is, uh, the coaches need to put together a good game plan and the players need to know the game plan and then be in position to execute the game plan. Well, the same is true of our lives. God has a game plan for your life, and, and the better you know the game plan and the better you're positioned to execute the game plan, that, that maximizes the best outcome for your life. And what we've seen in this series is that God has a sovereign plan. That's what God's going to do just because he's God and no one or nothing is going to stop him because he is good and he is sovereign. It's his sovereign plan. God's got a moral plan for your life, how we live in a way that, that honors him, that seeks his glory that that blesses us and the world around us. And he's got a personal plan for your life, how the very small, tiny story of you intersects the great, big, eternal story of God. He has a personal plan for your life. And the clearer you get on his sovereign plan, knowing what his sovereign plan is, the clearer you get on his moral plan, knowing what his moral plan is for your life, the clearer you are going to get on his personal plan for your life. So we've talked about how that works in this series. We've talked about how temptation will get you out of position to execute God's game plan in your life. Temptation will always take you further away from God's plan than you intended to go, and it will cost you more than you were willing to pay. So we spent two weeks talking about that. It's all online. You can go catch up there. But today what we're going to talk about as we wrap things up is what do you do in life when you need to make a comeback? Not when you make, need to make a comeback like, hey, we're a few days behind or we're a few dollars behind or whatever it is and we'll just, you know, double down. We'll, we'll go into full back mode on third and short and we'll, we'll tuck the ball in high and tight and keep the legs churning until we get that first down. I am talking about what do you do in life when you are hopelessly behind and a comeback looks out of reach. Okay, now how many of you are a pretty avid sports fan of some team whether it's football or baseball, all the Chicago Cubs fans are like, right here, this guy is a fan, right? This, hey, we respect, okay? This is your moment. Live it up. You earned it, all right? If you're an avid fan of, of a sports team, you know how frustrating it is when your team is hopelessly behind when you're watching, you know, when there are nine runs down or when there are 30 points down and there's still a lot of game left to go. You just don't even want to watch it. Even though you love the team, you follow them all the time, you're like, this is too painful to watch. But do you know what's more painful than that? If you've ever played organized sports, you've been in that position, haven't you? Who's played organized sports before? Okay, you know when your team is just getting smoked, okay? And, and you're, you're like, can we wind 15 minutes off the clock because they know how this is going to end. We know how this is going to end. All the people watching know how this is going to end. This is just painful. Is there a way we can fast forward this because this is embarrassing, right? We, you know what that feels like. But, but do you know what's worse than that? When somehow in some way in your personal life, you are hopelessly behind. And it does not look like a comeback is going to be possible. That, that feeling perhaps you've had in, in your marriage, when it doesn't look like it's going to make a comeback. And in fact, it's become so hopeless, you're not even sure you want it to come back anymore. What do you do when a comeback looks impossible in your marriage? Or for you, maybe it's your financial world. Things are so upside down financially in your life. You look at your financial situation and you say, There's, there is no comeback from this one. I, I, I'm not even going to get back to zero to say nothing of positive territory again. I, I don't see how a comeback is even possible. Or for you, maybe it's your health and you got the diagnosis and maybe it's not terminal, but it is going to be chronic or there's that injury that will not go away. And, and you realize that when it comes to an area of your health, you're never going to experience a comeback. A comeback looks completely impossible. It will always be there, hampering your forward progress. Maybe it's, it's in your faith in God, and you're not sure how you ended up in church this morning, or you're not sure how you ended up watching this online, because maybe you used to have faith in God, or you used to have hope in God, but you've gotten to a place today where God seems so far away, the idea of ever believing in God or trusting in God again, that that's just too, too much of a stretch. You, you don't see how that could even be possible. For some of us in the room, it's depression. 
and, and you've struggled with depression and, and you did not want to get out of bed this morning at all. And you are in such a dark valley today. You genuinely believe you will never experience joy again. You will never experience happiness again. You will never experience hope again. So what do you do in life when you're hopelessly behind? When hope has evaporated and it doesn't look like there's going to be a comeback? That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, if you look at your message notes, you'll see that uh, this is going to be a very busy sermon, okay? We've got like 10 fill-in-the-blanks today, so you might want to start stretching now. We don't want anyone to cramp up, uh, get hydrated. Also, it's going to be a very participatory sermon. You're going to have to talk a lot. You're going to have to speak a lot. And, and for, for you men in the room, let me just say something. You're probably like me, okay, where the preacher says, okay, everyone say after me. You're like, I'm not saying anything, okay? Honey, you and the kids, you can, you can repeat after him. I'm not saying anything. Just have a little fun today. We'll, we'll all loosen up. We'll, we'll, we'll all have a little fun and participate this morning. How many of you um, have any experience in your background as a child uh, going to Sunday school or vacation Bible school? Did you ever go to Sunday school or vacation Bible school a day in your life? Okay. Uh, somebody share. What was your favorite Bible story from Sunday school? Okay, Noah's Ark. That, that one time when Noah fearlessly trusted God and millions of people got killed. Great story to start with. Thank you. That, that's fantastic. What, what, what's another one? David and Goliath. Yeah, D David, you know, the shepherd boy, he faces this giant and he's fearless and he strikes him dead and then they go kill all the Philistines and thousands of people die. Great story. What else we got? Joshua and the battle of Jericho and then they march around the city seven times because you know where this is going, don't you? They march around the city seven times and the walls fall down and they go in and kill everybody. Great Bible story. We better stop. You're going to be like, man, we can't teach these stories to our kids anymore. We forget that we kind of sanitize that part in Sunday school, don't we? But we're inspired by all these amazing stories of faith where, where people are facing absolutely impossible odds. And they should be overwhelmed with terror. They should be overwhelmed with fear. The situation is hopeless, but they say, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to plant my feet. And if God says go, I'm going to go. And if God says stay, I'm going to stay. And if God says fight, I'm going to fight. And you walk out of Sunday school thinking, man, my God's so big. My God can do anything. I'm not afraid of anything. But then as we get older, what happens is those stories, they're, they're just hopeful for kids. And they, as adults, they don't grab our imagination and they do not give us hope and they do not give us confidence the way we did when we were kids. And I think the reason why is because what did we really have to be afraid of when we were children? I mean, if, if, if we could bring, you know, seven-year-old Jason on stage this morning and interview him, Jason, what are you afraid of? Let's see, I'm afraid of the dark. That's scary. Girls, let's see, getting picked last at recess, that's scary, right? Well, I mean, what, what do you kids have to be afraid of? For some of you in your childhood, you're, you're afraid your mom and dad are going to get divorced. Some of you faced fear because mom and dad did get divorced. Now, what does this mean for you? Depending on how many Disney movies you watched, you were afraid your parents were going to die, right? But there's, you know, we're, we're afraid of things as child, and those are real things for kids to be afraid of, right? And you can, you can relate to that. Even as an adult, you're like, yeah, yeah, I, used to, I did used to be afraid of that. There's real things to be afraid of when you're a child. But as we get older, the list of things to become afraid of, it goes exponential. There's so many more things to be afraid of that we are aware of than we, when we were kids. When we were kids, we, were, we had no idea how much there was to be afraid of. As we get older, Wow, there's a lot of things to fear in our world. You know, there's the economy, there's terrorism, there, you know, somebody's going to be elected president this week. There's, there, there's, there's health scares, there's economy, you know, you, you might lose your job. There, you know, there's so many things in our world today to be afraid of. And when that happens, when the deck is stacked against us, when we become fearful, when we get so far behind in any of these areas of life, the thing that evaporates is hope. And as hope evaporates, as you get behind in any of these areas of life, fear begins to take its place and fear settles in. Because there's a lot to be afraid of. So today to help with that, 
we're going to read something that was written a very long time ago by a man named David. Maybe you know him as King David. King David is a great guy to listen to when it comes to making a comeback. David is a great guy to listen to when it comes to being fearful. When it comes to being in a place where hope is evaporating or it has completely evaporated because the stuff that we're afraid of today, it looks very childish compared to what David had to deal with in his lifetime. Look at how his life got started. He was the youngest kid in his family. All his brothers were off doing man stuff. He was the boy. He had to go shepherd his father's sheep. And his dad said, okay, here's the sheep. Take them out. Here's your slingshot. In case there's any bears, make sure you kill them today. Okay, you don't send your kid off on a bike without a helmet on. He had to go to work with a slingshot and kill bears to save the sheep. That was his childhood. Then as he started to grow up, not quite a man yet, he faces Goliath on the battlefield, takes him down. And then Saul, who was the king, saw how popular David was becoming, and he even heard through the grapevine, David's going to be the next king. And he tried to kill David. David had to run for his life. He became an outlaw. He became a fugitive. He had to run into the desert and go into hiding. And, and, then, and then you think your job is stressful. Eventually, he did become king. Okay? He had an entire nation to keep him up at night. He had an entire national economy and security to worry about in, in his line of work. And all of this is not in the modern world that we live in. It's in the ancient world. Okay? The ancient world was filled with plagues and terror and lack of security and no internet or cell phones. It was a horrible place to live. And when he led his troops out into battle, he didn't send them in from the, no, from the Oval Office. He himself walked in front of his soldiers into battle t- dozens of times for hand-to-hand combat with his enemies. On top of that, his personal life was a train wreck at times. It was filled with adultery, infidelity, murder. He was the king, and that got to his head once in a while. He had a few women. And one time, one of his sons from one of his wives raped one of his daughters from another one of his wives. And then another one of his sons got so mad at that guy, he killed his stepbrother. Okay, you think your Thanksgiving is going to be awkward this year? Imagine David's family. Another time, one of his sons tried to lead a coup against David and almost pulled it off. Once again, David had to run for his life. David had a lot to be afraid of. And David, in his life, time and time again, found himself in situations where he was hopelessly behind. But here's what's interesting about David. No matter how hopelessly behind David was, David knew the secret to never lose hope. No matter how hopelessly behind David was, fear never entered into his heart because he learned something that drove out the fear and gave him hope in each and every situation that he had to face in life. And he wrote about this in many of his works, pieces of art, that today we call the Psalms. The Psalms are a collection of ancient poems and songs. Uh, They're recorded in the Bible for us, so we could read them today. And David was the author of many of them. And the reason why people throughout the ages have loved the Psalms is because the Psalms speak the language of the soul. They speak the language of the human soul. They give words to, to, to the indiscernible parts of who we are as human beings. And they help us speak to God. They help us speak our joys. And they help us speak our fears. And they they help us speak our hopes and our longings in ways that that most of us lack the words for. They're, They're beautiful art. And today we're looking at one psalm in particular. Many, many people say this is the crown jewel of all the psalms, Psalm 23. It is a psalm that has been loved by millions of people for centuries. Even people who are not Christians love this psalm because all by itself, it's just a beautiful piece of art. I mean, to to listen to this psalm, it's like staring at a Rembrandt painting. You just get lost in it. You lose yourself in it. That's what this psalm is. It's beautiful art, but not only is it beautiful art, it reveals a beautiful truth that speaks to our hearts and teaches us how to live without fear, teaches us how to live with great hope. No matter what you are facing and no matter how hopelessly you are, behind in your life, and it does not look like there's going to be a comeback in this psalm. David teaches us to live lives without fear, with confidence in him. 
And I am so afraid to preach this this morning because like, this is like everyone's favorite psalm and I'm afraid I'm going to ruin it for you. I've not touched this in almost 15 years of preaching because I don't want to wreck it. So today I'm just going to take that risk. And if I wreck it, I apologize. Hopefully uh, we'll get through it together today. What you need to know about the psalm going in is that in English, this psalm has six verses to it, uh, but in the Hebrew language in which it was written, it did not have six verses. It had two stanzas. Each stanza was four lines long, and in between, there was one line. And, and in this ancient poetry style, the line that was in between the two stanzas, that was the theme of the psalm. That was like the central idea. So if you look at your message notes this morning, the psalm is not broken down by verse. It's broken down by original line, stanza one, then there's the middle line, and then there's stanza two. We're going to walk through this together, and in it, we're going to discover what David learned when it comes to living lives that are filled with hope, without fear, when you need to make a comeback, and a comeback looks impossible. Here's the theme of the psalm today. This is the central line of the psalm in Hebrew, and this is the main point. I'm giving it to you right up front. The main point is this, for you are with me. God, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And what we're going to discover today is no no matter what you are walking through today, the reason why you can have hope and confidence is because God is with you, And he has something that will comfort you. You ready to get started? You have to talk this morning. This is going to be interactive, remember? All right. Line one, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Psalm 1, verse 1, opening line. I'm a sheep. Now, most animals can get on pretty well on their own. Chickens seem to do okay. Horses, they do all right. Cows do pretty well. Sheep, however, need a shepherd. Sheep are animals that if you turn them loose in a green pasture, they will eat that pasture down to brown until there is nothing left. They will eat it so far down, the grass so far down, it won't grow again, and then they will starve not knowing that 200 yards away there's another green pasture they could eat in. They will die in that brown pasture. That's sheep. Sheep need a shepherd because they are not brilliant animals. In fact, no one, and I did a Google search, no one has ever named their mascot the fighting sheep. (laughs) Right? That's just, you know, the the lamest animals out there are sheep. And, And David says, if you think there's a lot to be afraid of, it's worse than you thought of it. You're not even a cow, okay? You're a sheep. And there is more to be afraid of than you even thought was out there. But you have a shepherd. But you have a shepherd and you are not alone who is keeping a watchful eye over you. And if you have a shepherd, you lack nothing. You have a shepherd who will make you lie down in green pastures. Now, He doesn't help you lie down. He doesn't suggest you lie down. He makes you lie down. And from our perspective, a green pasture might not look like a green pasture from God's perspective. A green pasture from God's perspective might be a hospital bed. A green pasture from God's perspective might be letting the consequences of sin catch up with you in your life. Because you've been pursuing meaning and joy in life in ways far away from God. You've been looking in brown, dried up, dead fields. God says, I'm going to lead you to something that is going to make you dependent on me. And it will be a source of life for you. Because I am your shepherd and I will lead you to where you need to be. But David realized, no matter what I am going through, even though I am helpless, I don't believe I can control the outcomes. I don't believe I am the master of my fate or the captain of my ship. I believe God is, and I believe I have a shepherd. And if I have a shepherd who's looking out for me, I'm not going to lack anything. I'm going to be okay. Everything I need, I'm going to have, because David was a shepherd. He knew how this worked. And since he was a shepherd, the sheep always had what they needed. He said, I have a shepherd, which means I'm going to lack nothing. So here's the first fill in the blank this morning. I lack nothing because I have a shepherd. Turn to the person next to you and say, I lack nothing. 
Now say it like you mean it. I lack nothing. If you have a shepherd, you lack nothing. Think about this. When Jesus did his first miracle, changing water into wine, everything he needed for the miracle was already in the house. The jars were there. The water was there. People willing to trust him and do what he said. They were all there. You lack nothing. When Jesus fed 5,000 people, everything he needed to feed 5,000 people was already there in a boy's lunch sack. Here, here's my lunch. That's all I need. If you have Jesus, if you have a shepherd, you lack nothing. Line two. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. One of the hardest things about living in our age is that the waters are shallow. Shallow waters move fast and they make a lot of noise and they're rough. Deep waters are quiet waters. Still waters run deep. But we always have our phones. We always have distractions. We're people who can no longer focus. We're people who can no longer meditate. We use our phones as a form of self-medication. Man, I'm feeling stressed out. Wonder what's on Facebook. You know, we just use it to detach from the world and unwind for just a minute. God wants to lead us into his presence. God wants us to meditate on who he is and find joy and meaning and purpose underneath him and with him and through him. He wants us to be led into deep waters because in his presence, he will refresh you. In his presence, he will restore you. He says, turn that other stuff off. You need to be in my presence. The Bible does not say, be busy and know that I am God. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Do you know what David needed to get through every season with hope and without fear? He needed to know that, hey, I've got a shepherd, so I'm not going to lack anything. Second thing he needed to do is this. He needed to be still. He needed to be still. Turn to the person next to you and say, be still. When you are still in the presence of God, He will fight for you. The battle belongs to the Lord. The outcome belongs to the Lord. Rest in him. Be still. Let the shepherd do his job. Quit trying to be the shepherd. Be still. Line three. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Okay, he guides me in paths of righteousness. This is what we're talking about in this series. We call it game plan. David called it paths. Your life is a path. You choose a path through life. God has a path for your life. It's a path of righteousness, a path of his glory, a path of living his way, a path of honoring him, a path of knowing him. That's his game plan for your life. Walk along this path. And he does not want you to turn to the right or to the left because things aren't working out in your favor. He does not want you to turn to the right or the left because things are scary right now. He wants you to keep walking his path of righteousness. And did you see the reason why here? Not for your benefit, but why? For his name's sake. God says, I hate to burst your bubble, but if your life is only going to be about you and what makes you happy, you are going to lead a very small and meaningless life. If the thing that really upsets you in life is that you're not comfortable and and you're not happy, if the thing that you really are all about in life is people loving you and admiring you and being all about you and being successful and gaining an audience and people love you and adore you and they, they love you and they clap for you, but then if your path doesn't intersect my path when your story comes to an end and all the clapping stops, what was your life? God says, I want your path to be a path of righteousness so it intersects my life and it intersects my story. See, your life isn't about you. If it is, you have a small life. I want it to be about something bigger and I want it to be about the path of righteousness and the reason why is for my name's sake. Fill in this blank. God is for God. It's for his name's sake, not for you. God is more into himself than he is into you, okay? Which is a good thing. Because if God was into you more than God was into God, God would be an idolater and he would be worshiping a false God named you. God is for God. And as a result, he will do things that are about his love, his justice, his sovereign plan, and that is going to be very good for you. But we get so worked up because life isn't going according to my plan. God says, I've got a plan of righteousness. I've got a sovereign plan. And I want your little plan to intersect my big plan because I am for God. He will do this for his name's sake. God is for God. Next one. 
even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. David never claimed there's nothing to be afraid of. He was very aware at how many things there are to be afraid of in our world, again, especially in the life he lived. But he said, even though, even though, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, underline the word through in your notes, if you will, please, through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil. Because although I am in it, I am walking through it. And here's what David knew. David knew, next fill in the blank, that if God brought me to it, he will lead me through it. If God brought me to it, he will lead me through it. Turn to the person next to you and say, if God brought you to it, he will lead you through it. Okay, if God brought you to a season of adversity, he is doing it for his namesake. And he will lead you through that season of adversity for his namesake. David says, even though I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to fear evil. You brought me to this, God. You'll lead me through this valley, God. Now, friends, this is more than a season of life. This is more than, uh uh-oh, you got the bad health news. This is more than, oh man, I made a mess of my marriage. This is all of life. All of life in a fallen world is the valley of the shadow of death. We live in the valley of the shadow of death. We live where there is evil around us every day. We live here. But David said, God will lead me through here. He's going to, at the end of the second stanza, he's going to show where he's going to lead us. But David was confident, even in overwhelming odds, even when a comeback looked impossible, God brought me to here. God will lead me through here. All right, then we get to our central line, the main theme of this psalm. For you are with me, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they come for me. A rod, it could also be translated scepter, that's what a king wields. A king wields a rod, a king wields a scepter, this is what a king holds on to. A staff is the tool of a shepherd. A, a staff is used to guide sheep, correct sheep, poke and prod sheep. David says, the reason why I'm not afraid in the valley of the shadow of death is because I have a shepherd king. I have a king who is not distant and sovereign, and I have a shepherd who is not weak and inferior. I have a shepherd who is looking out for my path, who will supply my needs, who is also a sovereign king. I have a shepherd king, and shepherd king, you are with me. Now, notice what happened to the language in this psalm. He starts by talking to you. He says, hey, I've got a shepherd. I'm not going to lack anything. He makes me lie down. He leaves me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Uh, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. All of a sudden, the language changes. You are with me. See, he starts the psalm wanting to tell you how amazing God is. He starts the psalm wanting to tell you how remarkable it is to have a shepherd king. But, but halfway through his poem, his heart is overcome with worship. He forgets you, and he starts worshiping God. He forgets you, and he starts talking to God. And for the rest of this psalm, he's just talking to God. He's like, he forgot why he he was trying to explain something to you, and he got so drawn up in who God is and the fact that he has a shepherd king. He's just going to worship God and praise God and thank God from here on out. But here's the big idea. In your season of adversity where hope is evaporating, there is a shepherd king with you walking with you. And because he has a rod and because he has a staff, that's a comfort to you. It means he's going to guide you and he has all power and authority in his hands. So here's the fill in the blank for for this line. If God is with me, who can stand against me? If God is with me, who can stand against me? Turn to your neighbor and say, if God is with me, who can stand against me? Now answer him. You're like, what's the answer? Give it to me. I don't know. know. (laughs) Nobody is the answer. No, No one. If the shepherd king, if the shepherd king is with you, no one can stand against you. And David says, you want to know why I'm not afraid in a hopeless situation? You want to know why I have hope in a hopeless situation? Because nothing's impossible for my shepherd king. And he's with me. I'm good. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, but I've got a shepherd king with me. Stanza two. Line one of stanza two. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David's not saying the enemies are going away. His whole life he had enemies. They didn't go away. 
I mean, they, the cast of characters changed, but he always had enemies. But he said, even in the presence of my enemies, God's going to show up. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to be honored at his table. And I'm going to acknowledge him. So here's what we have for this one. I will toast the one who saved me. I will toast the one who saved me. Go ahead and turn to your friend and say, I will toast the one who saved me. In the presence of your enemies, you can still raise a glass to God and say, God, you're with me. You're going to save me. You're amazing. I'm going to honor you even in the presence of my enemies. Line two of stanza two. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. So in ancient times, to anoint your head with oil, that was a sign of honor. You're, you're a valued guest in my home. You are important to me, and I, and, and you, I, I want to honor you. David says, God, you honor me. And, and I've made such a mess of my family. I've made such a mess of my life. So many times I've gotten off your path of righteousness, yet God, you, you, you honor me. You, you, you anoint my head with oil. That's, that's amazing. That, 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 that's who you are, God. I didn't earn that. I didn't do that. In fact, my cup overflows. That's just a way of saying, I mean, when I, when I look at the blessings I have from you, God, it's ridiculous. It's, it's like a rap video. It's just, you know, just pouring out and out and out and out. There's just so much of it. I can't believe it. It's just, you know, I can't even keep up with you. That's how much blessing you have in my life. So here's our fill in the blank for this one. God is generous in his blessing. God is generous in his blessing. Say to your friend, God is generous in his blessing. Yeah, he, he loves to bless in ridiculous ways. See, we, we, we start thinking, we start thinking we lack things. We, we think we don't have enough. We, we fall into this thinking that, no, God's not going to come through. I'm going to lack something. Uh-oh, David says, no, 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 no. You have a shepherd. You lack nothing. He's generous with his blessings. What are you worried about? I mean, I, I just look at the story of this church. When, when this church got started, we were so broke, we had to go to KFC and lick other people's fingers. There was nothing here when this church got going. And now people come in and they say, man, must be rough. I mean, yeah, you're a portable church, but you got the screens and you got the, the audio and all the lights. It must be rough. And I'm like, yeah, you think the stuff just fell out of the sky one day? And here we, no, it was people who said, we're, we're going to follow God. We're going to trust him. And we know he's generous with his blessings. And if we have a shepherd king named Jesus, are we really going to lack anything that we need to proclaim the name of Jesus? No. And neither are you. L listen, listen to me. In your life, you lack nothing. God is generous in his blessings because you have a shepherd king named Jesus. And he honors you. Not because of who you are, he honors you because of who he is. I'm going to get to more of that in just a minute. Surely, your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Now, now, goodness, we know what that word is. Love is a very technical Hebrew word. It comes up about 250 times in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word is chesed. I won't make you say that to your neighbor. But it's a word that means loving kindness. It's, it, it's, it's a love that is merciful. It's a love that is generous. It is a love that is kind. And David writes, as I walk through, your, through my life, your goodness and your loving kindness, your mercy, they are going to follow me each and every day of my life. Now, the Hebrew word for follow um, doesn't just mean to follow. It's a more aggressive word than that. It, it means to pursue. Or if it's used in a negative context, it means persecute. In other words, this is a love that is going to track you down. It is going to hunt you down. It is relentless and it will not stop. And David says, every single day of my life, I'm going to wake up and the merciful loving kindness of my shepherd king is going to track me down. It is going to pursue me. It is going to overtake me because his love is relentless for me. That's my life, and that's my shepherd king. What am I going to be afraid of if what's pursuing me even more hotly than my enemies is the loving kindness of my shepherd king? So here's our next fill in the blank. God's love pursues me. God's love pursues me. I want you to tell the person next to you that God's love pursues you. And it's not going to stop. 
Today, you woke up. Did you know when you woke up, God's love is pursuing you? Tomorrow morning when you wake up, God's love is going to pursue you. He is relentless. Then he ends this way. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, during David's life, the place where they went to worship God was the tabernacle. It was basically an elaborate tent where they had church. And David went to God and he said, God, you're better than a tent. I want to build you a magnificent temple. And, and God said to David, thank you, but you don't get to build me a temple. David, see, you, you, you honored me with your life, but you're a man of blood. Your son is going to build a temple for my name. So, so what David did is he collected all the resources, all, all the materials, over $30 billion worth of goods in today's economy so that his son could build a house for the Lord, could build a temple for the Lord. David never got to see what he wanted to do with his life, which was just honor God by saying, I'm going to build a temple that's worthy of your name, God. That's what he wanted to do. He wasn't allowed to. But that didn't bum him out. Do you know why? So he said, that's not the true house of the Lord. That's just a building on earth. I know where I'm going to live. I'm going to live in God's house. I'm going to dwell in God's presence. And that is going to be forever. For all of my days, when I die, I get to live in God's house. And I get to see the face of my shepherd king. And I get to glorify him for all of eternity. That's where I'm going to end up. So here's this film, the blank. My best days are before me. My best days are before me. Say to your friend, your best days are before you. So if that's true, if your best days are before you, let's not become fearful of today. If your best days are in front of you, let's not become hopeless about today because you have a shepherd king who is with you and walking, and will bless you, and will take you to live with him forever. Now, how could David possibly know all of this? All David had were, were, were a few promises from God that I'm never going to leave you or forsake you, and that someday you will have a son who will truly build a house for my name. But it's not going to be your son, Solomon, but it is going to be another son, a descendant of you. David, you are going to have a great, 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 great grandson, who will be the shepherd king, who will shepherd his people with the sovereign power and walk himself through the valley of the shadow of death so that you can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Look at a couple of ways that a couple other people from the Bible were inspired by Psalm 23. The first was Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah lived about 300 years after David. And here's what Isaiah wrote. He says, and you, th you have to imagine he was thinking of Psalm 23 when he wrote this. He said, we all, all of us, we all like sheep, not even fighting sheep, we're just sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. See, we, we, we got lost, we, we went into sin, we wandered away from God, we, we walked towards pastures with no life, only death. But, but what did God do about that? And the Lord has laid on him, talking about Jesus, our shepherd king, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. all. All of the sins, all of the times we did not measure up, God said, I'm going to place that on the shepherd king Jesus. He will bear the punishment. He will bear the consequence for your sins of wandering away from God. And then the second person who clued into what David wrote in Psalm 23, was Jesus. Because when Jesus lived, here's what he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, the shepherd king you are to see in Psalm 23 is Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the fulfillment of that. I'm the shepherd king, except I will not just guide you in the paths of righteousness. I will not just walk through the valley of the shadow of death with you. He said, I will walk through death for you. I will walk through death before you in your place. 
so that when you are finished walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it will only result in life and in dwelling in God's presence forever. Because I am a good shepherd and I choose to lay down my life for you. So here's our last fill in the blank this morning. Jesus is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Jesus is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Do you know what you do when hope evaporates? When a comeback looks impossible? I suggest you get out this psalm. And you let the, the beauty of the psalm speak to your soul and you let it speak for your soul and see the beauty to which the psalm points. That you have a shepherd king who loves you, who pursues you, who walks with you, who died for you, who has given you a home forever in heaven. And as you meditate on that and pray through that, hope will return to your soul. Hope will return to to your heart. Joy will return to your heart. And you will have a brand new perspective on the adversity you're going through. And you'll say, if, if God wants me to have a comeback in this area of my life, the shepherd king will guide me there. If God doesn't want me to have a comeback in this season of my life, because David did not come back from everything. He had a lot of pain. He had a lot of sorrow. He had a lot of hardship. And he said, if God does not want to come back in this area of my life, I trust him. I trust him because of who he is. I trust him because he is a shepherd king. And I trust him because my life isn't about this issue anyway. My life is hidden with God in heaven and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you might make a comeback. You might not make a comeback. But you will not be alone. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this beautiful art we have in the Psalms. Thank you for giving us words that speak the language of the soul. Thank you, Jesus, that you know what it feels like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death because you did it for us. You lived the lives we could not live. You died the death we deserve to die, paying for our sins, suffering God's wrath, so that we can dwell in your presence forever. For the man or woman listening today, and they, they are just filled with fear, God, drive out that fear. Your perfect love drives out fear, and your love is pursuing us. Help us to see that. Let us be a people of hope. Let us be a people of courage. Let us be a people who are so fixed on your eternal glories that whatever season we're walking through, we will be able to say, it is well with our souls that we will be a people of peace and joy, honoring you. I ask for this blessing in your name, Jesus. Amen.